Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our webcast viewers. My name is Willa Black, Director of the Canadian Club of Toronto, and your host. Viewers, thank you for joining us. As you know, our club provides a forum for local, national, and international thought leaders to share their ideas. In planning our events, not only do we strive to ensure a diversity of perspectives, but of speakers as well, and today's panel is a perfect example of that. I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of today's sponsor, CIBC. Thank you very much for your support. And now, let me introduce this morning's topic. Despite our nation's vast physical size, our aging population and low birth rate pose challenges for our future growth and economic competitiveness. The Century Initiative believes our future prosperity depends on significantly growing Canada's population and has put a target out there, 100, people, 100 million people by 2100. What are the opportunities and risks of focusing on population growth? What's in it for us? There are many strategic implications for us to consider. Joining us today are Dominic Barton. We, if you could all please come as I... Actually, you can all just come right now. Why don't we do that? Get you all in place. We'll give them a minute to sit down before I read about them. Dominic Barton. Mr. Barton is the global managing partner of McKinsey & Company. He is also the chair of the Canadian Minister of Finance's Advisory Council on Economic Growth. The Honorable Ahmed D. Hussein. Minister Hussein is a lawyer by training who entered federal politics in 2015. He was appointed as the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship in January 2017. Goldie Hyder. Mr. Hyder is President and CEO of Hill & Knowlton Canada. Prior to joining Hill & Knowlton, he served as Director of Policy and Chief of Staff to the former Prime Minister and Federal PC Party Leader, the Right Honourable Joe Clark. Savan Pelvetsian. Ms. Palvetsian has been CEO at Civic Action for four years. Prior to Civic Action, she held several senior positions in the Ontario government. Mark Wiseman. Mark is a senior managing director at BlackRock and previously served as president and CEO of the Canada Pension Plan Insurance Investment Board. And moderating this morning's discussion is Adrian Batra, editor-in-chief of the Toronto Sun and 24-Hour Toronto. But first, we're delighted to have Mark Wiseman provide opening remarks. Mark is a co-founder and chair of the Century Initiative. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mark and Marcy Moffat for sponsoring the youth and young leaders here today at the Ryerson Leadership Labs. I don't know where you are, but welcome. And after Mark concludes his remarks, we will launch right into our panel discussion. Mark, it is my pleasure to turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Willa, and uh, thanks to our uh, our panelists in advance, and thank you uh, for coming uh, early on a uh, snowy uh, March morning uh, here in Toronto. I'm going to be uh, reasonably brief and set the stage for our panel. Um, I think they're much more interesting uh, than I am, um, but I want to give you some context uh, this morning. The context is about why Canada needs to be bigger. We don't mean geographically bigger, we mean bigger in terms of our population. Let's just look around the world. Japan is at a tipping point. By 2100, Japan will lose 34% of its population today. Their goal is to remain above 100 million, from nearly 140 million just a couple of years ago. In Eastern Europe, 11 countries have shrunk by more than 10% just since the wall came down in 1989. In fact, by 2015, Bulgaria will shrink, have shrunk by 23% and Latvia by 25% just since, um, uh, by 2015 they had shrunk by 23 and 25% respectively uh, since the fall of the wall in 1989. 48 countries around the world in fact, expect to see population declines by 2050. This will have a devastating impact on their economies, and many of them are still resisting immigration 
even in light of the cold, hard facts. Canada runs the risk of suffering the same fate. Now, we're not that bad. We're not shrinking today. Today, we have nearly 37 million people in our country. However, our fertility rate is under 1.6. The replacement rate is 2.1. And we are growing slightly, but only because we're letting in just over 300,000 uh, immigrants a year. Now, as the minister will likely tell you on the panel, the government of Canada is committed to modest growth over the next three years. But at this pace, we will only get to about 50 million people by 2050, and then essentially we stop, even with that same pace of immigration. In fact, uh, projections of the Conference Board of Canada would suggest that from 2050 to 2100, we will only grow by four million people. We need to get ahead of the curve. We need to address this issue today. And that is what the Century Initiative is about. It is about thinking about Canadian growth, economic growth and prosperity. Our goal is to see a Canada with 100 million people by 2100. Now that may sound crazy today when you drive on the 401 or try and get on a subway car at Bloor and Young. But we're not suggesting that it all happens today. We have 82 years to accomplish this goal. And the Century Initiative, in fact, is not just about more people in this country, whether it be through immigration or uh, increased fertility. It is about doing that in the context of a dynamic and innovative economy, successfully leveraging Canada's diversity, successfully leveraging our resources, and becoming more credible and more influential in the world. And there is a strong link between scale and prosperity. We are subscale today. Arguably at 100 million, we are still subscale in this country. At our current population trajectory, Canada's GDP growth between today and 2100 will be 1.6% on average per annum. If we change that trajectory to get to 100 million people by 2100, uh, we increase by a full 1% GDP growth per annum to 2.6%. Now, neither of those numbers uh, are particularly fast rabbits, but that's the world that we're facing today. So, in fact, we can increase GDP growth uh, by over 30% if we change uh, our trajectory in terms of our growth perspective uh, in terms of population. But it's not just GDP overall. It is also about prosperity of individuals and individual families. As you know, I was uh, formerly the President and CEO of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. You know our pensions are under pressure, and we were very lucky in Canada that we had pension reform in the late 90s to address the problem with our dependency ratio. What do I mean by dependency ratio? Dependency ratio very simply means the number of people of working age in a population relative to those who are 65 years of age or over. In fact, when the Canada Pension Plan was set up in 1966, the dependency ratio in this country was six to one. There were six workers for every retiree. Today, it is under four to one. By 2035, it will be under two to one. So having a greater population having a younger population, having a more vibrant population, having a more economically empowered uh, population, not only helps GDP growth, but it helps GDP per capita. This is why we have to begin acting now, and this is why the Century Initiative was formed. It is about creating inclusive prosperity for our country. This country needs a long-term strategy. This country needs a goal to set itself against. And in many respects, it's not achieving that the goal that's important, but the road to getting there. If you think of John F. Kennedy's, uh, in his inauguration address, his goal of putting a man on the moon and returning that man safely to Earth by the end of the decade, 
which the United States successfully did. The accomplishment of putting a man on the moon actually wasn't that important. We didn't get much by having Neil Armstrong jumping around. But the benefits, the internet, GPS technology, the building up of our universities in the United States, the increase of information, um, and the very fact that people believe that they could achieve something is really what that was all about. So the journey to 2100 is in many respects more important uh, than the goal uh, itself. So we are starting from a good base in this country. We have a reasonably positive view, and the Minister may talk about this, about immigration compared to almost anywhere else in the world. In fact, uh, close to half of Canadians support immigration, and another 20%, if you tell them that it will help the economy, that's close to 70% of Canadians. If you, if you prompt them and say, how do you feel about immigration, 50% or so will say that they're in favour. And if you tell them, how do you feel about immigration, given that it will help the economy, another 20% or 70%, more than two-thirds of Canadians are supportive. That's unique in the world. We have a great starting place. Now, the Century Initiative, which you'll hear a little bit more about, is not just about immigration, however. We don't want a prosperous, dumb Canada. Uh, or we don't want a uh, big Canada with gridlock. The Century Initiative is, of course, about immigration, because that is the most important tool to getting to us to our goal. But we have other important pillars of that grand strategy that we believe the country requires. Urban development has to be a big part of the plan. Early childhood support to allow families to be able to afford to have children and to be able to access programs for their children so that those children can thrive and become contributors and bigger contributors to society. We support a national daycare strategy that allows us to enable all Canadians uh, to work uh, throughout their life. We support, so, so immigration, urban development, early childhood support, education is the fourth pillar. We need a world-class talent pool for the 21st century. We need skills to match a changing economy. And we need to have a positive approach to reskilling those who may be left behind as the country modernizes. And finally, our fifth pillar relates to employment and entrepreneurship. We need to have job opportunities and we need to have op entrepreneurs that are going to utilize the private sector to build the growth that we talked about in terms of both GDP and GDP per capita. So this is what we're proposing. Immigration, urban development, early childhood support, education, and employment and entrepreneurship. Now, we are doing some cool things. Uh, we're not just talking. And as Dominic Barton has said several times, in many respects, the Century Initiative is about being a do tank as opposed to being a think tank. So we are launching on Monday uh, something called Thought Patterns that you'll hear a little bit more about. This is an innovative survey, and I use the term survey very loosely, um, because it is uh, interactive and it can be used to help form public policy um, and its first iteration is on immigration but we will be using it to support our other goals as well. So I'd encourage you uh, to go to uh, www.thoughtpatterns, all one word, uh, .ca and try it out and please share uh, that link with others. Over the next year and beyond, the Century Initiative is planned to grow nationally, to publish, promote a vision of a bigger and better Canada, to make our case for population growth, to increase engagement, particularly with young people, and to work with others and other organizations in town halls and roundtables across the country so that we can bring tangible ideas forward for implementation. The time is now to seize the moment with a bold, responsible, and long-term approach to Canada. We believe that, 21, uh, but that 100 million people by 2100 is today's national railway. It's 
on the, on the heels of Canada's 150th birthday, we need a new grand project. And we believe that 100 million by 2100 is it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, my colleagues on the panel. Um, and in addition, I also uh, want to take this opportunity to welcome formally uh, the new Chief Executive Officer of the Century Initiative, uh, Sherry Austin, there's Sherry, uh, who joined us. Uh, <laughs> who joined us from the Royal Bank and, you know, has just the small task of figuring out um, how, how we get uh, about another 64 million people into the country. So, Sherry, uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, with that, I will turn it over uh, to our moderator and to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning uh, on what is, I think, a very important conversation that many Canadians aren't having. We probably should have. So we're happy to uh, give you some ideas and thoughts about uh, going into your March break with your kids and have this very important conversation with them about <laughs> immigration patterns in Canada. <laughs> Um, we're fortunate enough to have the minister responsible here, and Mr. Minister, I'm going to start put you to work right away and put you on the spot. Your government um, came out with a very large, very expensive budget this week. What in there actually specifically talks about such an, uh, the initiatives that we're discussing today with respect to growing our, our, our country, how do you sustain that, and actually how do we even pay for these sorts of things? So I think I'll begin by <clears throat> stating that uh, when I presented the uh, multi-year immigration levels in November of last year, it was the first multi-year plan for immigration in, uh, in, in about two decades. Uh, the reason for that is businesses, cities, provinces, community groups were saying that immigration is too important to have one-year plans. So we presented a three-year plan to give them the flexibility to know what's coming up, but also to give us the flexibility to, to adjust uh, from year to year. And that plan, uh, when I presented it uh, with cabinet approval uh, and with the assurance that it'll be, it'll be fully uh, budgeted. And so I had the confidence that uh, those numbers uh, were, uh, would be fulfilled. Now, they're very ambitious because when we took over government, I think the annual uh, uh, numbers were around 250,000 a year. So we, with the Syria initiative and, and, and just being more ambitious, we ramped that number up to 300,000, which was historic uh, in 2016 and 2017. But this year, there's a gradual increase to 310, and then next year, 330, and then the year after that, 340. So almost a million immigrants, uh, permanent residents, uh, for the next three years. 60% of that is in, in the economic uh, side of things, 20% family reunification, and then the rest, refugees and protected persons. So it's a, it's a very good balance. It's fully uh, paid for, and it really addresses the, the needs of the country and tries as much as possible through the provincial nominee program, for example, to spread the benefits of Im immigration across the country, not just within the large cities. Um, so I believe that uh, budget 2018 uh, funds that and, and puts us uh, and gets us really close to 1% of the population. So by the end of this, it'll be 0.9% mm -hmm. of the population will be, will be coming in as permanent immigrants okay. uh, to Canada. So, um, Dominic, I want to put this to you. Why do we need to increase Canada's population? We heard some of the numbers, and numbers are good to hear, but... Uh, what does it actually mean to Canada? Well, I think as Mark said, the, the, probably the biggest one is the productivity growth. You know, in the Growth Council, when we looked, we sort of did our diagnostic. You know, Canada, over the last 50 years, has benefited from a huge demographic mm -hmm. tailwind, and it's going the other way, right? And we're, I think Mark was kind of polite about Canada. We're actually, we are the fastest aging OECD country after Japan, and Japan's not a great benchmark for us to look at. So if we do nothing, expect half the GDP growth that we've got, which we simply can't do. And it's, it's not just about, therefore, having more people. It's, we, we also found in all of our discussions across the country, whether you're in ag food, whether you're in tech companies, there was a deep yearning for talent, global talent, to be able to get it on, across all sectors. People saying there, there are shortages that are going on. And I think 
one of the things the government did right away was actually fast track the the, the sort of high skill area, which is really needed now for our tech companies that are growing quickly. Headquarters are moved depending on whether you can move people. So it isn't just about the number, it's about these are jobs and skills we actually need, need to have. And the other thing I would just say is we have a, an amazing intake with our university system. You know, for Australia, Australia's third largest export is education, right? We are, we, we were, it's our 11th. We have a lot of talent that wants to come here. Why wouldn't we want them to be able to stay young talent that's highly educated to move in? And so it's for those, that range of reasons that we, we are very keen. You know, our, our number was, was higher. We wanted to go to 450,000, which shocked a few people. But again, we were, we were happy that the government is moving it forward. We have to adjust because if people come in, they have to be able to have jobs. So we also looked at even also licensing. You've all heard the stories about the, you know, the Iranian, you know, neural scientist that's driving a taxi and so forth. And we've got to make sure that when people that do come in get absorbed. And I think there's a lot that's been done on that side. So. Okay. Uh, Savon, in your work at Civic Action, you guys talk a lot about infrastructure, government policy, priorities, spending, things like that. Um, what aren't we talking about when it comes to growing our population to 100 million people? So let me start by saying I love how bold the 100 million number is. I love that Canada every once in a while stands up to the plate and just decides to whack it right off there. So I love the boldness. But when I heard about the plan and I thought more about what that does to life in an urban setting, which is where these folks are coming to, right? They're not going to the farmer's fields, they're coming to our cities. Mm -hmm. I thought about two issues in particular that nobody is really paying attention to. One, you have a glass of in front of you right now, water. The 500 largest cities in the world today, one in four is experiencing water stress. 70% of the planet covered by water. 3% is usable for drinking water. And later this year, in July, in Cape Town, South Africa, day zero happens. You heard about it? It's when the water runs out. It's when the taps from your home don't have water coming out, and you will need to go to one of 200 water centers where you are entitled to a 90-second shower. This conditioning routine is more than 90 <laughs> seconds, let me just say that. A 90-second shower, so and, you gold, fill exactly. one, and you fill one Nalgene bottle, bottle of water. That's coming in South Africa to Cape Town this July. So water is not a topic. When I flip through the federal budget, and there are some amazing pieces in there that this government ought to be proud of, it's MIA. Air. Across the pond. The mayor of London is staking his legacy on air. 9,000 people a year die in London, premature deaths because of the quality of the air. Babies are being born premature, malnourished, it's affecting the health and quality, and we get a lot of our air from, other from where the US is pumping it up, and we're breathing it and it's affecting us. Are we thinking about that? Because I sit at a lot of city building tables, and I don't hear these two topics being talked about too much. Those are two topics that worry me. The third, if I may, we're, we're talking about now. And it was in the budget. In fact, it was mentioned 700 times. If I told you that there was one innovation that would pump $150 billion into the Canadian economy over the next eight years, you ready for it? Yeah. Ovaries. It's women. <laughs> women. The, the ability to get women plugged into the labor market pumps that much money into our economy. I'm thrilled that Ottawa has come to the table on this new, new thing, right? But we need to see plugging in at a whole cost of other areas where this topic and where this true representation of economic power can really resonate. It was actually mentioned 358 times. <laughs> <laughs> we counted, we counted. Um, very good points. Okay, so Goldie, let me put this to you. Um, in, the, in light of what uh, Savon just mentioned, very important points, and I don't think that the average person even considers these things. So are we sure what we're talking about today is actually a good idea? You know, I, I'd like to answer the question about the future by looking to the past. Because okay. there's that old saying, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And I was thinking back to, it's 2018 now, where was the conversation in 1918? Mm -hmm. right? In 1918, I suspect there were same concerns, same fears about air or water or the quality, whatever those things were. In 1918, I wrote this down to make sure I get this right, we were 8.1 million people. 
Mm -hmm. 82 years later, in the year 2000, we were 30 million um, 700,000 people. 3.7 times we increased our population in that 82-year period. So when you look at what the Century Initiative is talking about today, in the year 2018, 82 years from now, we're saying let's go from 36 plus million to 100 million. It represents 2.7 times the increase. So in fact, we're asking for less population growth in the next 82 years than we had in that 82-year period that we just identified. I think it's natural, it's human nature to be concerned about the unknown and fear. And that's probably one of the reasons that I think we run the risk of having a society that is getting more complacent. Not only is it aging, it's getting comfortable. It's getting complacent. And the more that we travel, Dominic and I were just in India together last week, and you see the hunger in places. You assume that everybody's that hungry out there now. They're all trying to recruit their talent. They're all trying to retain their talent. Um, you've heard the numbers from Mark. This is not imaginary. These are, these are facts. What I think we have to manage, though, is, and, and you know, the points that were raised, they're valid. They don't change the facts about the demographics. Mm -hmm. And if we want to sustain and develop the kind of Canada that, that we have, one that um, is probably the greatest experiment in the nation of all nations, it's playing itself out right here. But nothing lasts forever. You have to work at it, and you have to have a strategy. And I think the thing that attracted me to the Century Initiative was what Mark said. It's time for a, sort of a big, hairy, audacious goal for what is the promise of this country. And it's okay to have issues that are raised, that what are we going to do about the gridlock? What are we going to do about the water? What are we going to do about more women in the work? All of those are important parts of the conversation. But it doesn't change what we need to do to stay and preserve and grow what is a great country. All right, but a lot of that is going to take good public policy. Yeah. So I don't dis think it's, uh, it, uh, we're able to discount the fact that we have a growing infrastructure gap and that we are not able to sustain the roads and bridges and things that we have right now. So we know that the larger populations like Vancouver, Montreal and Toronto, that's where a large majority of the immigration population has been, the immigrants have been moving to and the GTHA. How do we keep them from just moving into the larger cities? How do we get them into Saskatchewan, Manitoba? It's cold there, my hometown, Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, but how do we ensure that those municipalities, those jurisdictions remain sustainable and prosperous as well, Mr. Minister? So uh, the, the latest, uh, the 2016 census actually shows what you're trying to say. Um, Ontario used to receive over 50% of all the immigrants to Canada. It's now down to 35%. So they're all moving out west. Uh, the highest growth in newcomer settlement is seen in places like Regina and Saskatoon and Winnipeg. So, uh, so the idea that they're all going to Toronto and Vancouver is, is, is not as true as it was uh, 10 years ago. Secondly, uh, I think government has a role to to try to get, uh, to try to test out pilot programs to try to, again, spread the benefits of immigration beyond the big cities. And we are doing that. So if you look at the, uh, the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, it's a three-year program. It, it really addresses the labor market and uh, skills shortages and, and demographic challenges of Atlantic Canada. You want to see what Canada can look like if we don't move, as, as Goldie said. Uh, you, you go to Atlantic Canada, you'll see that the pressures there are already uh, much more acute than the rest of the country. And so that is why we introduced the Atlantic program there. It's, 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 a, it's a program really about retention. So not just attracting people there, but retaining them. And, and it, it really gets the employers to think about not just bringing a skilled worker to Atlantic Canada, but how do you keep them there? And, and so, you know, they're forced to work with settlement agencies and, 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 and think about the family, not just the, the worker, uh, but also increasing the provincial nominee program numbers, 33% increase. I think that, you know, I must say that the argument of do we need immigration, I think that argument is won in Canada. The, the question is, the, the next battle is how high? How high should the numbers be? Mm -hmm. And I think Dominic and, and Goldie have spoken about how they would like that number to be much higher, and, and so would I. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think 
a lot, a lot of Canadians do have positive uh, views on the role and the positive contributions of immigrants. I don't think many of us realize how critical that role is. Mm -hmm. And I, I really believe that if, if, if more of that happened, we, would, we could, I, I think, you know, the political system would be able to, to, to even be more ambitious in immigration. But I'm happy that we are and, and that we should continue. The case is made. I mean, 1972, we had 6.6 .6 working Canadians for each retiree. By 2012, that ratio was uh, four, four, four working Canadians to support each retiree. If we don't do anything, as, as Goldie said, by 2036, which is less than 20 years from now, it'll be down to two to one. So two working Canadians supporting a retiree. How are we going to maintain our much cherished uh, social programs uh, and, and maintain infrastructure? Newfoundland and Labrador, for every 100 uh, workers who come into the workforce, 125 leave. They, they need 4,000 immigrants today just to maintain their standard of living. So I, I think it's, it's fine and dandy for Canadians to realize the, the, the positive aspects of immigration, but I, I'm way more impatient than that. I think <laughs> if we realized how critical immigration is to uh, not even growing, just maintaining our standard of living, I think we would be, public opinion would be open to much higher numbers annually. Okay. You know you're already elected. You don't have to make speeches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making a speech. I'm just making observations. Can I add one thing to that, Adrian? Yes, I mean, please. What, you asked about how. I think public policy is the lever that allows that to be possible. It's by default that we're having urbanization occur. People are coming here because that's where the investments are going. There's no reason you can't create through the use of public policy. Uh, your super clusters don't have to be in Toronto. They don't have to be in Vancouver. They, don't, yeah. they could be in cities that don't exist today that we can develop and grow because the policy is the government is going to allow for some investment. People are going to come there. They're going to work there. And I assure you, uh, if somebody back in the 1970s had told my parents, you don't have to go to Calgary or Toronto, you can go to Moose Jaw or Timmins or Moncton, because they're going to give us some kind of a job mm -hmm. and or a tax policy break, whether it's property taxes or small business taxes, we would have gone there. Mm -hmm. We probably would still be there, because no way would we move from Moncton to Toronto. Like, who would want to sit in the gridlock like that? So tax policy can be a lever, as can this notion of the investments and governments are making in super clusters. Now is that time. The decisions that we're making now will determine whether what we're talking about for 2100 are possible. It's too late to try and do this in 20 years shy of 2100. We need to make those choices now, and that's why we're advocating for what we're advocating. Dominic, we got a question from someone uh, on Twitter, and I want to put this to you. And it, uh, I, I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but just to boil it down. Why should we consider moving to 100 million people when we have so many issues in our own backyard with respect to Aboriginal land claims and um, unable to pay for our health care and education as it stands right now? Well, yeah, I guess I don't think those are mutually exclusive. I mean, I think, you know, by the way, 100 million, I'm sorry to say, is not a big number. I'm just, let's put things in perspective. Chongqing has the population of Canada today in one city, right? And it's not... I'm not going to move to Chongqing because it's a wonderful place to live. I'm just saying we, the, the, we, we can actually do both. I, I really believe we can. And I think they'll, having that ambition, as Mark and others have said, is about scale in terms of what we do. And, and we, we will have to do infrastructure in a fundamentally different way. We, we do do a poor job. We have a $500 billion gap now. But, but I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. I think, I think what it takes is determination, as Mark said, having a goal moves people uh, towards where we move it. We, I find it ironic that a lot of our Canadian pension funds are, are funding infrastructure in places like Australia, Chile, and others because of, the, I think, the public policy that, that's there. And, and it's a, there's huge opportunities here for us to do it. We've got amazing organizations on water, leading companies on water that are doing work all, all around Asia. So I, I actually think they're not, they're not trade-offs, if you will. We can do both. They're, they're serious issues, but, but we can do both. We, we should not accept infrastructure gridlock. It's not, it's not rocket science to figure that stuff out. You know, we, you know what apparently is rocket science, though, which, which, which baffles me? So if you're having a dinner party and you want people to leave, you've run out of the wine, it's just the box stuff from the basement you've pulled up at this point. If you want to clear out a dinner party, you say, who wants to talk about governance? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and then the coats come out and the Ubers get ordered and everybody heads out of your house. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If we want to absorb any more people than we currently have, we need to figure out how to govern ourselves better. Let me give you an example. Cities which are on the front lines of absorbing anybody that's born or anybody that arrives, okay, now manage 60% of public infrastructure and get about 10 cents of the tax dollar. You don't need an MBA, though we have some smart folks with them up here to do that math to realize that doesn't work. And legally, cities need to balance their budget. So where we're going to fund this infrastructure and how we're going to manage to get people in agreement on the infrastructure that we know ought to be built baffles me. 25 kilometers. Add the Bloor Bike, line pilot, the Bloor bike Lane um, pilot, the King Street car pilot, the one-stop Scarborough subway, Add those three together, we're talking about 25 kilometers. People are losing their mind about 25 kilometers. We wanted this to be the new railway of the 21st century. 25 kilometers doesn't mm -hmm. build you that far. Right. And we have seen councils across this country argue till they're blue in the face, re-debate, re-vote, re-study, re-EA, and we're getting nowhere. So if we want to live the ambition that all of us have in our hearts and in our business plans and in our vision statements, then my God, we need to figure out a new way to govern how we live. And we need to also see a next generation of leaders step up and willing to assume boldness as part of the job description when you take those roles on. I know a quicker way to get people out of your party. <laughs> Don't talk about government, but talk about the Constitution. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> I mean, the Constitution in my house is sacrosanct. No, yeah. that is a wonderful topic. That's how you topic. need to do it. But let's go back to the Constitution. So when you look at the original framework that created Canada, cities were a footnote. There's more references to brothels than there are to cities in the foundation document that created this country. Well. And cities are still the toddlers in the family of governance because the feds give the powers to the provinces who in turn turn it over to the cities. Give it to the city. That's broken. Yeah. Uh, Dominic, there's a question directed f specifically for you. Um, doesn't it fundamentally come down to jobs and job opportunities? How do we increase Canada's private innovation platform? Well, I think as we're all saying, we don't just want immigration if we're not able to create the jobs. And I think, first of all, there are a lot of unfilled jobs right now. And actually in some of the high end and the more basic skill area, there's just there's yeah. gaps. We heard about Atlantic yeah. Canada. I mean, people are, there's just not the people uh, that are there, but I think we do need to get our kind of flywheel going on how we can create more jobs faster. And I, I, I do think the super cluster idea. One, one of the winners is actually in Saskatoon. I was there last week. The protein super cluster, which I think is a really interesting idea. A lot of organizations from around the world would like to be participating in that because there's a, a center. And we need more. We need more growth capital because we Canada actually we we benchmark ourselves versus other countries, we're actually very good at coming up with ideas, literally one of the best in the world, top three in most categories. Mm -hmm. But what we're not very good at is turning those ideas into commercial, scalable businesses. We just stop. Like, and, and that's where I think we've got to get that, that engine going. And, and that, that's growth capital. It's how we do our education and so forth. And again, I sometimes think having a, a big goal jolts you out of a system as opposed to incrementally crawling along and, and saying if you're, if you're really going to have to want to get to that level, um, you're going to have to think about some things differently. And the other part I just was just, let's please look at what other places around the world. We may whine and complain about, and I understand the 25 kilometers, but it's a, you know, let's, that, that's just a joke. We, we should talk and say, is that serious? We're seriously going to, I didn't know that, but we, we're going to put up with that stuff when, when people are doing this every day in their sleep in other parts of the world, and we're funding it. So I, I hope that by having a big ambition, it forces you to challenge orthodoxies mm -hmm. and, and say, we have to do things fundamentally different. That's part of the benefit. Welcome to Toronto, the world-class city. But it's also, like at, it's also mm -hmm. re-examining immigration as, uh, as, as a tool for job creation for Canadians. Uh, you see examples of that over and over and over again. Uh, not only in the high-tech field, but also in the low-skilled uh, sector. So you have, you know, you, you have, you, you go to certain parts of this country and you see hotels, very nice-looking hotels. You go in and a, a section of the hotel 
says, you know, closed for renovation. It's not closed for renovation. They just can't find enough people to, to manage the, you know, to, to work in that wing. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to, uh, to the, to, you know, I, I met the president of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. He's, he tells me 54% um, of, of, of their membership can't fill uh, skilled or semi-skilled or skilled positions. That's a problem. And so, you know, immigration is one of the tools to address that. But more importantly, the startup visa program, you know, going out into the world and, and, and bringing to Canada very quickly, promising startups to then scale up and create jobs for thousands and thousands of Canadians is, is a great tool to have. The global skills strategy that Dom uh, just talked about, bringing folks here, uh, high talented folks in, in 10 days. Those things do make a difference. And when you talk to employers across this country, they'll tell you that, you know, you have sometimes, even in small towns, you have this one immigrant coming in to perform a, a niche service that because they're there, all these other people are employed. Without their presence, it wouldn't be possible. So we have to start looking at immigration as a job creating tool for all of us and, and, and really prosperity for all of us, as opposed to, well, how are we going to get jobs for all these people? That's, that's not true in many cases. So let me sort of put that uh, in the context of what we have right now. So we all have heard the analogy of the cab driver with the PhD, the grocery store clerk with a medical degree. By the way, that's no longer that's true. That's no longer true. It's true for medicine, but many, many professions have moved. So Pharmacy, how, law, how and all that. So it's no then longer true. That if we're, we want smart immigration, yeah. right? We want the best and the brightest. If, if other countries don't want them, we want the best and, and their brightest. Um, how do we ensure then they come to our country? Uh, those various private organizations that you know regulate the bodies and regulate the industries and do all these things that they are not protectionist and they're open-minded and they are actually working with government and other uh, other, and other and private industry to ensure that they get qualified to come here yeah. and actually work and contribute. So to be fair, like I said, many many professional bodies have actually moved. So the 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 the, the story of the prof professional newcomer driving a cab is not as true today as it was many, many years ago. In medicine, it's still true. I agree, I'll give you that, but not true for the rest of it. I think that the, the professional bodies have to be more enlightened, but I think there is a role for government. And we, you know, th there's a strategy that a lot of you haven't probably heard of that was in the last budget, uh, the, the targeted employment strategy for newcomers. This is targeted to professional newcomers. And it starts with pre-arrival services, because a lot of new, pro, newcomer professionals have told us, look, don't tell us what we need to do to get licensed when we land in Canada. Tell us before we get here. So that, because when we are trying to come to Canada, we have something that we won't have as much when we get there, which is time. So connecting the professional bodies with the engineer from Ecuador so uh, we know that engineer from Ecuador, from our data, will come to Saskatchewan. So connecting them with that professional body so that they can start the licensing process in Ecuador and hit the ground running when they land in Canada. Once they're in Canada, a lot of times it's not the professional body. It's people are, you know, are here, they're working, they suddenly have bills to pay, and so they, they, they have a very easy and clear path to licensing, but they don't have the money to pay for the exams. They can't stop working for a couple of months to study. So it's, it's those soft barriers. And this targeted employment strategy actually addresses that by giving them loans, saying, here, pay for the books, pay for the application fee, pay for the exams, and yes, quit your job for a couple of months and study to be that doctor, lawyer, nurse, electrician that we want you to be. And then when they finish, what, what are they told? Yeah, it's great that you're a licensed engineer in Ontario, but you don't have Canadian work experience. So some of that money is going to actually pay them uh, an internship to get that experience so that they can be both licensed mm -hmm. and, uh, and have the work experience. And then mentorship, job matching, all that. Because again, the, the job titles in their home country are not matching with our, with our job titles, but it's the same thing. So, so it is being addressed. And I think um, and it, it's also important to give credit to some of the professional bodies that have moved. 
But yes, we still need a lot of work to... Uh, we should look at why yeah. they moved. I think, the story, I think the story is not that they have moved as much as it is why they moved. Why they moved is there's identifiable shortages in almost every one of those professional sectors. I was on a flight the other day where a person is a recruiter to place people in the techno emerging technology industries in Montreal. I said, how's business? He said, well, I'm really struggling. I said, really? Why is that? He said, well, I get paid when I place people into jobs. I can't find them. Mm -hmm. I, I can't find them. And I think so what's happening is that these bodies were forced to respond to the fact that there is a genuine shortage of professionals, whether you're engineers or tech, technology or in other, other industries, and they responded to that. And that's just the beginning of what is going to be an ongoing trend here because of all the demographic things we've been talking about. All right. And we only have a few short minutes left. So there are still some cue cards around. If you um, would like to pose a question to the panel, we'll try to uh, get it in. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Canadian Club TO as well. Um, Savan, we, all of these things sound great, they sound important, they sound reasonable. Uh, none of this is excessive, none of this is over the top, but it's very expensive. And um, when the proverbial rubber meets the road, I just don't believe we are prepared for it and nor are we planning for it long term. Mm. Um, with your experience, you work with municipalities, you work in, 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 at the local level of government. Uh, you already mentioned, of course, that the cities are creatures of the province. You know, they, will have, they have to go beg to the upper levels of government in order to do anything. Um, how do you believe then municipal jurisdictions, who are ultimately going to have to bear the brunt of the infrastructure, the immigration, the people, the healthcare, the resources, how do they make their case? Mm -hmm. Well, I want, to, I want to tweak, if I could, the response to that to focus in on one area where the ambition is going to hurt, mm -hmm. okay? And cities will feel this the most. All of us have arrived to Canada at some point. In my family's case, it was 100 years ago when my mid came from the Armenian Genocide and came to Canada. And that's where our family has grown and that's where our, our relationships have since, have since um, happened. You pick Canada in part because the dream that comes with it. It's the, it's the receipt you're supposed to hang on to when you get your passport for the first time, this image of what being in Canada is. But we are starting to see the formula that made success possible, it's broken. It used to be if you went to university and you got a degree, then you could afford the degree and you could get the job, and you could get the house, you could have the kids, you could pay for the daycare, you'd retire, there'd be something waiting for you, and you rode into the sunset. That formula is broken. And as different industries shut down because jobs are changing and higher skills are expected, you're watching people medicate themselves to death. The opioid crisis was not on the tongues of anyone in this town five years ago, with the exception of some high qualified public health experts. In the US right now, due in part to steel, mill, steel plants, timber production falling, uh, manufacturing dropping, people are medicating themselves in record numbers. More people have died last year from the opioid crisis than Afghanistan, Iraq, and Vietnam wars combined. It's here now. It's here. It hasn't swelled, but it's coming. And it's hitting blue collar and white collar and every socioeconomic level. That's an issue that we need to plan for as we bring these numbers in. Because the jobs will change so fast that we can't expect people to keep pace. And what we do with those people when they don't keep pace is all of our responsibilities. And the ball has already dropped south of the border. It's bouncing here now, and I do expect that to be an issue we need to wrap our arms around. Dominic, did you want to weigh in on that as well? I, I completely agree. I think this reskilling is going to be the biggest issue of our time for, for everyone. And the problem is it's reskilling 45 to 55 year olds, not just the young people coming mm -hmm. in. And, I, and again, I, I, but I, and no one in the world is dealing with the scale of what's coming on. I think that's something we, we have, we, we're actually in a great place to be able to do it given our size, mm -hmm. and as much as our governance may not be where it needs to be, we can actually get people together to be able to move it. And I think that's the, that, that reskilling challenge, to do it not to get reskilled over four years, but part-time while I'm doing a job, is doable. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that will be a big, a big part of, of making, this, uh, making this all work for everyone. Goldie, you're in the uh, public relations business. Uh, we keep hearing Canada's back. Were you in India playing dress up with the Prime Minister last I week? Was. I was. I didn't dress um, up, but I was there. Yeah. So, um, why is Canada still attractive as a place for immigrants to come? Well, or look, is uh, it? Uh, 
it, it is, but I think we run the risk of resting on our laurels that, um, you know, build it and they shall come. That's true. Not no more. Yeah. I mean, again, as I mentioned, Dom and I were in India last time. You want to see a, a group of people that are actually looking at staying where they are because everybody's coming there. It's all of the young people in the Indian population. I mean, their statistics are mind-boggling compared to ours in terms of how young they are. And so we assume that everybody wants to come here, everybody wants to be here. I think it's important, as, as we've been trying to talk, we want the right people here. Mm -hmm. And to attract those right people, you have to have a brand that goes beyond nice, um, it goes beyond yeah. cool, yeah. or nice socks, or great hair. It's got to go beyond that. <laughs> it's it's got to go to, are we entrepreneurial? Um, are we creative? Are we business friendly? Uh, do, we, do we have a society in which people can come and have their careers and their ambitions and their, their passions realized? We need to show that. And there is a risk here that we rest on our brand of, you know, we're great. Um, that's not enough. There's a lot of great places in the world now, and I think the competition for talent has become so, so, I mean, you've seen it and others have seen it. It's come to a place where, um, and we're seeing examples of this now. We, we have a, a, a challenge based on our competitiveness, based on our productivity, and people, uh, when they're choosing a place to come, they do their homework. Mm -hmm. They're doing their homework. I mean, I know that stat about the, 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 uh, the retiree, two to one. That doesn't excite me to want to move here. Right? <laughs> that makes me feel like I'm coming here to help all of us in this room retire. Uh, that's not why I want to move here. And so we have to do something about those things. And so I think, you look, look at Australia. Spent $100 million on going out and rebranding itself. It resulted in greater tourism, greater foreign students, greater foreign investment, trade deals with other nations. You have to act. My only concern is, are we waiting for a crisis in Canada? Mm -hmm. Because we're just too comfortable, we're mm -hmm. just too complacent. My dad likes to say the definition of long-term planning in Canada is, what are you doing this weekend? <laughs> I think we need to get past that in a hurry. <laughs> well, that will be for next time's panel, because we right. are unfortunately out of time. Mr. Minister, thank you for being such a great sport and being no here with us. Dominic, Savon, Goldie, um, a lot of food for thought. Ladies and gentlemen, we really hope you enjoyed that, and thank you to the Canadian Club for hosting us today. Thank you, Adrian. So distinguished speakers, fantastic panel. It was really a, a great way to start the day. On behalf of the Canadian Club of Toronto, thank you for inspiring us with your bold vision for Canada. And thank you so much, Adrian, for your exceptional moderating skills, for keeping track of the conversation, which went off in all kinds of fabulous directions, and your insightful and, and challenging questions. You, you didn't hold back, and we appreciate that. Um, we may be a small country by population size, but as Dominic pointed out, we're big on ideas. Top three in the world, I did not know that. And the Century Initiative reminds us that we have an opportunity to act boldly, to realize the vision set out before us this morning, and in Mark's words, the next national railway, the next grand project. Immigration contributes to productivity growth, economic growth, supports social programs, it's all connected. And we applaud the Century Initiative for framing a discussion so elemental and critical to future generations of Canadians, the, the promise of this country. Um, we all look forward to hearing more about this do tank in the months and years ahead. So thank you very much. Before we conclude, here are some highlights of upcoming club events. On Tuesday, March 6, the Canadian Club will present a timely panel discussion on workplace sexual harassment and how to navigate a path forward in the wake of the Me Too movement. And on the following day, Wednesday, March 6, the Honourable Peter Milton, Ontario's Minister of Housing, will speak to us about Ontario's Fair Housing Plan. To order your tickets or to learn more about the club, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. We can also you can also join the conversation via Twitter and Instagram, following us at Canadian Club TO. We would also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VBC for live streaming today's event. And another round of thanks to today's sponsor, CIBC. Thank you so much, panel. It was a fantastic morning, very provocative discussion. We were thrilled to have you. And thanks to all of you for attending uh, at this very early hour. We hope you have a great day. <laughs>